that battery lasts. Okay, well, what I wanted to do today just to get us started was to talk a little bit about this idea of history as progress, which is what's introduced on that page 169. And it forms a theme for this third part of the course because we're going to be looking at two different types of socialists, St. Thomas More, who's a, uh, you might call a rationalist or a humanist socialist, and Karl Marx, who's more of a determinist socialist. So we, uh, one of the benefits of this unit, I guess, is to see that socialism is an idea that's been around a long time and it manifests in many different ways. And here we have, on the one hand, a uh, devout Catholic uh, who came up with socialist ideas, and on the other hand, a you know, very uh, determined atheist who came up with socialist ideas and, and they moved in different directions. But in order to get that discussion started, I need to talk about history and the way that these thinkers view history, okay? Because um, especially when it comes to Marx, it's important to know history is an enormously important factor, the way that he views history, which really hasn't been a factor for the first two units with idealism and realism. You know, uh, hardly at all for the idealists. The ancient idealists didn't think in terms of history. Um, their reference was to mythology more than history. For the uh, realists, you know, even now, but with Machiavelli we see for sure, the use of history is as a sort of gold mine or database where you can gather information, but the information is kind of timeless. The realists assume that human nature stays the same pretty much forever, okay? So if you know human nature, you know what to do about politics. But Karl Marx in particular, and more to a certain extent, view human nature as changeable. For Marx, it changed over time. There was nothing fixed about human nature. So history was very important, very important to look at, to, to try to see how human nature had changed and where we were, we were headed. So I just wanted to briefly talk about different ways that we can view history. I think we all tend to see history as naturally progress now, but th that isn't the only way to view history. Uh, one way, which it was popular for a long time, was as cyclical with peaks and valleys across time. And <clears throat> these historians and thinkers who viewed history in this way tended to look at the very peaks of civilization, like ancient Greece and ancient Rome and the British Empire, okay? Um, the Chinese dynasties, as what you focused on is sort of the, the peak achievements of human beings that human beings could make. And then the valleys are those times of chaos and war in which civilization breaks down and there's no real progress in literature and the arts and sciences and so forth. And they saw human, uh, human experience like this. You know, the Dark Ages in Europe would be a great valley for them. And they would say, well, a lot of what people had learned up to that point, they lost. And then they had to regain and so forth. Um, now, what's important to know about this approach to history, which sometimes is called the great man approach to history, because it focuses on even on individuals and what individual leaders did uh, to produce the peaks of their civilization. What's important to know about it from our perspective here and what we're doing is that it assumed free will on the part of people involved in making history. Okay? That's why the great man approach, the idea that a Napoleon or a Caesar um, has a lot to do with how the civilization turns out and what it does at any given point. Great leadership can produce great change and, and growth in a society. And a lack of great leadership, and also they say maybe a breakdown in values might be another way that they view the decline that can happen in a society. The breakdown happens because individual people choose to do things in a different way and maybe don't choose the best way. So this way of doing history places praise and blame on people for the choices that they make. And if they achieve great things, it's because individual leaders and also the people within that society chose to work hard, had good ideas, great instincts and leadership and so forth. And if they fail, it is because of the opposite, because of the poor choices they made, the poor values that they embraced and so forth. Okay? 
So that's the cyclical view of history, and it's still a pretty popular way of looking at history on the part of people who write books about history um, that people like to read, you know, because a lot of times when you go to read history, you want to get examples, great generals or leaders or artists or whatever. It's inspiring, and it helps explain a lot, okay? So for the average reader, that's often a nice approach. Whoops, sorry. A second approach to history is as a decline, from a peak to a low point, okay? Or from a golden age into, oh, mediocrity, okay? This was popular, especially in the 19th century. Oswald Spengler is an example of a historian who looked at the world in this way. They tended to look at the ancient civilizations as the peak of human achievement. You know, the Periclean Greece and um, the Roman Empire. These were, <coughs> these were the pinnacles of human achievement, and people kind of declined from that point. Uh, or some commentators might say that uh, during the beginning of the Christian era, there was this uh, discovery of a new moral framework, but then as time went by, people forgot about those, didn't embrace them, moved away further and further from those moral ideals. Okay? Historians that take this approach are kind of hard to read. They tend to be depressing, okay? because they treat the here and now as that low point. You know? and, and they don't usually give you an idea of how you can really um, come back from that, okay? Uh, but again, for our purposes, it's important to note that even if you view history as pretty much continual decline from some great point in the past, the decline is still attributed to human choice. Mm -hmm. Well, conceivably. Pat Buchanan's good. I wouldn't, wouldn't want to put him completely into that category, but People who, like Buchanan, point out a lot of moral problems you know, and uh, tend to discuss moral and intellectual decay in Western society, at least partly fall into that category. Their focus is on what we've lost, and there's a, a sort of despair about it. Okay? So yeah, to a certain extent. Um, but you know, as I said, the hopeful thing or the thing that separates the even this type of historian from the type that we're going to be discussing is that they do assume that poor choices, emphasis on choices, okay? Choices of individuals, choices of people in societies lead to this decline, okay? Somebody like Buchanan might talk about, you know, when people decided that um, it was okay to get divorced for any reason. This was a moral, you know, a morally bad decision that led to more family issues, which then led to you know, uh, family breakup and so forth. So, but the choice was theirs, and they chose that for reasons that they had, for reasons of freedom and so forth. Okay? And then we can also look at history as the opposite, as a matter of progress from a low point of a rather uncivilized state to a much higher form of civilization. Okay? Now you might ask, well, how can people see things so very differently? Well, it, it depends on what they focus in on. You know, you, you mentioned Buchanan, I mentioned Oswald Spengler. Spengler. These are people who look primarily at the values of society. You know, what do people value? What do people admire? And they tend to think we've kind of sunk compared to where we were in the past. So they tend to look at the past as a sort of, maybe they see it idealistically, <coughs> but as more of a golden age. People who look at history as progress look at learning, at you know, science, technology, medicine, <coughs> right, where you can see progress. Okay? Um, they even point to politics when they, they uh, often write about the spread of democratic institutions around the globe. And they mark that as a form of progress, or the fact that the standard of living of the average person around the world has actually gradually increased over time. Okay? So they point to evidence like that, and uh, as I say there, they tend to see us going from a primitive state to a modern state. So they don't look at ancient 
ancient Greeks and Romans as the pinnacle of civilization. After all, what did they know? Okay. Yes, they discovered a few things, but compared to what we know now about mathematics, about science, not even politics, it seems to them that they didn't know that much. Okay. Um, so from this vision, humankind gradually improves because it builds, it builds the knowledge, the learning, the progress builds on itself. Okay? And some of these thinkers do see, because of this progress that they see, a future that is perfect. In other words, they, some of them envision a time when human beings will actually have figured out and solved all of the most pressing problems that have been plaguing us for all these millennia. Okay? So it can be a very hopeful vision as opposed to the depressing uh, history as decline. And there are two types of ways of looking at history as progress, which we're going to be discussing in this unit. Okay? The first kind is the way of Thomas More. And he's the socialist that we're going to be looking at first. And you don't, by the way, you don't have to be a socialist to believe in history as progress. Almost everybody in Western society believes it as history as progress, but they're not all socialists. But they believe that we're building and building and getting better and better and better. But these two are socialists. Okay? Now, Thomas More was the type of socialist who believed that we would make progress because people were going to learn from their mistakes. Okay? And that over time, they would see the folly of irrational practices and replace those irrational practices with ones that made sense. If they did so, they would then see they made a better situation and they would continue to improve. Okay? So Thomas More still assumes free will because he still takes the approach that people see that they can change their world and they take steps to make it happen. The reason why he wrote Utopia was to try to push that, okay? To try to persuade the people around him that changing things, especially in economics, would make everybody better off and make everybody happier. But it was still a matter of choice for Thomas More, okay? Then the second type of history as linear progress is different. It's really different from any other approach to history. Okay? And I want to emphasize that now. So we'll be talking more about the difference between Moore and Marx here. But this is Marx's way, and also the way of Immanuel Kant. I write about him in the textbook, but we're not covering him in this class. So he, Kant saw history as progress towards what we might called now liberal democracy. He believed that eventually the, the world, the entire world, would embrace democracy. And there would be no more conflict among nations. They would trade freely with each other. They would all have the same basic democratic institutions. And this would happen in a deterministic way uh, as people uh, embraced, in a sort of evolutionary way, what worked best. Okay? For Kant, it was obvious that capitalism worked best, that basically free trade made people better off in the long run. So that's what he envisioned that the end state would be like. For him, he thought it was quite obvious that people would be happier with more freedom than with less. And so over time, those nations that gave people more freedom would be more productive, more militarily strong, and literally would do in some of the ones that resisted giving people that amount of freedom. Okay? So Kant viewed history as, let's just say, sort of an evolutionary progress process in which those nations that were weaker would either have to change and adapt or be weeded out and destroyed by those that were stronger. Okay? If that doesn't sound like the Kant that you learned in philosophy class, that's probably because you didn't get taught the stuff that he wrote about politics. And then there's Marx and Engels. Okay? And, that, and we'll be reading the Communist Manifesto. We'll be talking about some of the other things that they wrote. Marx and Engels believe that the forces of production, the technology that people use to make them, and the way that technology determined who owned what property was what determined at any given point how people would live, what their political system would look like, what their economic system would look like, what their morals would look like, and so forth. And that technological change was out of the control of anyone. Leaders couldn't stop it. They could only be basically tools of historical change. People couldn't stop it. There was no one to blame for it. Many people get the impression that Marx and Engels thought that capitalists were evil and blamed the 
blame them for doing bad things to people? No, they didn't blame them. Capitalists existed because the economic system demanded that approach at that point in time. Okay? But they were to be superseded by the communist system. So Marx and Engels deny free will. They don't place any emphasis on the choices that people make. People make the choices they do because they make sense to them at the time and because there really is no other way that they could go. Okay? So they don't spend any time blaming the parties involved. Instead, they talk about these great forces that propel whole societies in a certain direction towards a certain type of production, say from the feudal, small farming uh, type of production to industrial production. Okay? And how much difference that makes in the lives of people and the way they're governed and so forth. Okay? So it has its benefits, it has its drawbacks. A big drawback from the moral point of view is there is no place to place any blame. Blame doesn't matter in that type of system. On the other hand, it was this approach to communism or to socialist ideas that took off for the first time in human history, that went beyond just, oh, that's a nice idea. Because the explanation that Marx and Engels gave made sense to people at the time that it came up in the 19th century, okay, during the Industrial Revolution. And it was very hopeful in the sense that they predicted that communist change was going to happen regardless of who resisted it. Okay? It was simply inevitable. And that inspired people. So we're going to have to understand why it is that that particular approach gained so much traction and why it was so att uh, attractive to people. Okay? So first we're going to talk about Thomas More, and then we're going to get on into <coughs> Marx and Engels. Okay, and that's just a, I put that up there because that's kind of a plan for future reading. We're going to read through page 73 of Thomas More's Utopia, not the whole book. Okay, so if you want to move ahead or just know where we're headed, that's where we're headed. Okay, so what I want to do now is discuss a little bit more the difference between these two thinkers, More and Marx, Marx and Engels, and then talk a little bit more about More, who he was, why is he important. Okay. All right. Now, many of you have probably learned a little bit about Marx already. I would bet that maybe even before you came to K-State in your high school classes, you learned a little bit about Marx. And for a lot of you, I would guess your reaction was, well, that's completely unrealistic. And maybe you might even apply the word idealistic or utopian to Marx's ideas, because Marx predicts this monumental change in which eventually the entire world embraces communism and there's universal peace, okay? Harmony, everybody's in agreement. So it would be natural if you learn those ideas to think, well, that was kind of hopeful, wishful thinking, and maybe say even that's utopian thinking. But what I want to emphasize is that Marx would have really disliked being categorized in this way, to being characterized as utopian. In fact, Marx very strongly separated himself from utopians, from thinkers like Thomas More. He thought there was a huge difference between the two. Right? So even though Marx's expectations seem so lofty, and from hindsight, many of us would say they disregard human nature. Marx felt as though he had very strong, solid, concrete reasons for writing what he did, for predicting the change that he did. Okay? And obviously, hindsight is 2020, right? And we know now that for a variety of reasons that we'll discuss, those ideas didn't translate into the type of action that Marx wanted. But nevertheless, Marx thought that he was writing something realistic and very concrete. Okay? Now, Thomas More and Karl Marx definitely share some ideas in common, and Marx wouldn't deny it. 
probably the most, the biggest idea that they share in common is this idea that private property is the source of evil. Now, Marx wouldn't use the term evil because he didn't think in terms of good versus evil, but the source of conflict, the source of poverty, okay? Private property was to be, was to be blamed for that. And both of them thought that private property was not a permanent fixture or didn't need to be in human society. So they went against liberal thinkers like Locke, for instance, or Adam Smith, who thought that private property was absolutely necessary. It was a natural thing for human beings to want to own it and so forth. Okay? But unlike Moore, Marx doesn't paint a utopian picture for people to embrace if they want to. But instead, he writes about these forces of history, the way that people produce things, what is produced, how it is exchanged, the economic classes that emerge because of those things, the political structure that comes out of the economic class structure. Those are the types of things that he writes about. And he writes about how these classes throughout history have conflicted with each other. And because of that conflict, from time to time, change occurs, revolutions occur. And he tries to prove that there will be that inevitable grandest of all revolutions in which one class completely absorbs the other and wipes out class differences. Okay? <coughs> Moore takes a completely different approach, and Marx knows it and rejects it. Okay. For more, he's trying to persuade. Now, he has this belief that human beings are getting smarter, that he was a humanist, okay? And he really seemed to believe that human beings were getting smarter over time. Okay? <coughs> but there was still this need for persuasion, and the role of the philosopher, Moore's role as he saw it, was to do that persuading, to show people why they should make better choices. Okay? So in that way, he's more akin to an idealist than he is a realist for sure, or to history as progress thinker like Marx. His job was to show that current practices were irrational, and we're going to be learning about those practices, but the England of Moore's day was full of <coughs> class distinctions, okay? If you were rich and you were of noble birth, you could get away with a lot. You could even get away with murder if you were well connected, okay? Whereas, if you were poor and you didn't have any connections, you couldn't get away with stealing a loaf of bread. You were going to be thrown in jail and maybe even hung. Okay? So, Moore looked around him and he saw these gross distinctions being made, depending on who you were, how much money you had, and so forth. And he saw that as really, not only unjust, but very counterproductive. Because if you keep people at a very low level economically and discourage them, <coughs> from improving their lives, the rest of society, even the upper class, suffers because they're not being productive. Okay? So his job was to change the mind of the people at the top. Marx, of course, tried to get the people at the bottom to rebel. Okay? <laughs> Moore's approach was, I've got to get Henry VIII, and I've got to get the you know, cardinal, and I've got to get these people who are the leaders of society to think about making some changes. Thomas More, as I said, he was a Catholic, okay, a uh, very devout Christian, um, and yet, and you know, just invite you to think about this because this isn't the obvious approach of the Catholic or the devout Christian. Um, he really did embrace this idea that property was the problem. Now, what would the what would the more sort of orthodox Christian approach be to what is the what causes conflict? In and injustice in society. Anybody have a guess? What's the cause of the problems that people make for themselves according to a tradition? Mm -hmm. Human imperfection. Yeah, human imperfection, sin. You know, for the old-fashioned Christian, even original sin. You know, the human nature itself, which produces the need for Christianity in the first place. Okay. But Moore doesn't go there, so his book isn't about Christianity as a solution. And that's just interesting. Okay? Um, instead, the solution is 
rearrange the way we handle property. Okay? In fact, eliminate property. And then reorganize society using rational principles, which would mean eliminating class distinctions, for instance. Because in Moore's view, they were artificial. Everybody was basically the same. Okay? Now, as I say, Marx would deny that he was utopian and would actually label somebody like Thomas More a utopian socialist. And for him, it was definitely a pejorative term. Okay? To be a utopian socialist for Marx was to be a dreamer. Or even worse, a tool of the capitalists. Okay? Marx viewed people like More as basically aiding and abetting the people who have property by giving them a sort of moral out where they could talk about, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we could all agree that we need to share with each other, but we can't, so we'll just continue to do things the way we do them now. But by reading a, a utopian socialist like Moore, it would give capitalists some venting for their guilty conscience. Okay? That's kind of the way Marx saw utopian socialism. It certainly didn't lead to any real overturning of the structures that were oppressing people. So, in Marx's view, as it says there, it was little more than an intellectual game. And really, in a way, it, it, it blocked progress. Not permanently, because in Marx's view, nothing could ultimately block progress. But he would put utopian socialists weirdly in the same sort of category as union leaders. Marx didn't like unions either, because for him, unions were trying to make a compromise with capitalists. Okay? And they were going to make a deal to get a little bit more than they had before, but they basically would still keep the capitalist structure in place. So for him, union, unionists just slowed the change down. I bet a lot of you didn't know that or didn't, wouldn't have imagined Karl Marx disliking labor unions. Okay. Actually, labor unions ended communism in Poland, which is also another interesting little historical irony. Yeah. Was a utopian. Mm -hmm. So that's saying that Marx, Marx would argue he is a utopian, but that more did a utopian. Yes, right. Marx would see more as a utopian, but he would deny that he himself was a utopian. And Marx saw himself as really the opposite. He called himself a scientific socialist as opposed to a utopian socialist. Right. And, and we're going to get into uh, in more detail why he used that term scientific and you know how Marx and Engels saw themselves. Any other questions so far? Okay, well, I'll talk, tell you a little bit about Thomas More. We also have a brief video that I'll show sometime this week on Thomas More's background, too. Um, interestingly, he became St. Thomas More only in 1935. Sometimes it takes a long time. The reason why he was made a saint by the Catholic Church is because he um, forfeited his life for his principles. He disagreed with... King Henry VIII divorcing his first wife. Henry VIII was very adamant about do, doing that, and so adamant that he eventually created the Church of England so that he could separate himself from the Catholic Church's authority and do what he wanted. Um, so Thomas More disapproved of that, and for that reason he was eventually jailed and executed. And, uh, and that's why he was uh, made a saint at a certain point. But not because of this book. And it's interesting because the, the book is the, probably the most that he's known for, the most important thing he's known for. And it just doesn't reflect the basic Christian theology. Okay? Um, it's not hostile to it either, but it's just, it's just not, it doesn't reflect Orthodox Christian theology. He was the son of a judge, and his trajectory was to become like his father, a lawyer. Okay. Um, and he tried to do that, but he was also at the same time attracted to the monastic life and thought about becoming a priest or a monk. And he actually tried that life for a while <coughs> to see if he was of the proper temperament, which is a fairly common practice. It takes, it certainly takes a certain type of temperament to deal with that type of life. 
Well, Thomas More found out that while he took his religion very, very seriously, he was not, um, he was not the appropriate person for that type of life, that the monastic life, the life of separation from the world was not for him. He just continued to be very concerned about the, the things that were going on in the world. Okay, So he felt that his best approach was to leave the monastery and to enter into <coughs> politics in a way. Okay? But he never, <coughs> he never stopped doing some of the things that he had learned in the monastery. So this was an unusually disciplined person who took, again, took his religion very, very seriously. He set aside time every day for prayer. He fasted at every opportunity. He continued to read the Bible and other religious documents faithfully. Okay? So in a lot of his life, his faith uh, was very important. And this is why, you know, when it came to the king, deciding he was going to do something that the church didn't want him to do, because the church was denying him that divorce. Thomas More was a political man, but his religion came before his politics, and when it came right down to it, he could not make a compromise on that type of issue. Neither did he make a huge deal over it, but he let the king know, by not going to his second wedding, for instance, um, that he did not approve. Okay? So that was always a part of his life. On the other hand, when he decided to get back into the rest of the world, okay, he decided to get married, for one thing, and he had several children, four children, uh, with Joan Cole, whom he married in 1505. And he got into his career, okay, and he worked himself up to the position that is somewhat like today's district attorney in the city of London pretty important position, and it was one from which he could combine some of his Christian moral principles with his job. London was in some ways a real cesspool at this time. It was full of crime and prostitution, and it was definitely full of poverty. And the way that these crimes were dealt with, for the most part, was very harshly. If people were caught pickpocketing or in prostitution, they would just be rounded up and thrown into jail and maybe kept there for a long time without ever coming to trial. And there were plenty of executions uh, for minor offenses. When Thomas More achieved this position, he started to turn those things around. Okay? And in his own way, tried to make an impact on the lives of the poor by trying to make the system of judgment and punishment more appropriate to the crimes involved. So in his own way, he tried to treat people with more respect and with more dignity through his position. Okay? And for that, he earned this reputation of friend of the court. So you see, this was Thomas More's approach to how he would deal with his religious principles through his, through his work. His wife died in 1511. And within a year, he remarried to Alice Middleton, which was not an unusual practice for a man at this time because marriage was not uh, as much about romance as it was about getting uh, different things accomplished. In this case, he needed somebody for his children. Okay, uh, so that would have, and he was a very eligible person to marry. In 1515, he wrote a book. This was probably the first shot across the bow, the short work, um, called The History of King Richard III. Um, it wasn't ever finished, but it did circulate, and people began to learn about it. It was eventually published. And because it targeted a king from the past who was tyrannical, even though it was really, when you look at hindsight, a sort of shot across the bow saying, hey, I don't approve of the way Henry VIII conducts his kingship. Of course, Henry VIII was better. Um, nevertheless, it was disregarded by Henry. Henry didn't take it as a form of criticism. It was a criticism of a past king, not a present king. This depiction of Richard III inspired Shakespeare in writing his own rendition of Richard III. 
So you could see in this work that zealous concern for just government, okay? That in this case, kings are put into place, supposedly people believe by God, okay? In order to do good things for people, for their people. Not to just simply enrich themselves or to wield power and dominate other people, but to do good things for them. So this is an example of the way Moore thought about government. In 1516, Moore published this book that you have, Utopia. And by this time, he was a member of a group of intellectuals that met in London. Uh, they called themselves humanists because they were interested in changing the human condition. By um, reason to solve human problems, and that a lot of things needed to be cast aside that didn't make sense anymore to them. Mm-hmm. Now, notice the way it was written. If you've read a little bit of it, well, and if you haven't, you will so soon notice that it's it's written as though it's a fiction. First of all, okay. Thomas More didn't write a tract here about, you know, I think this is unjust and that's unjust and here's how to change it. Instead, he depicts this imaginary society. Nobody knows where it is. And it's very fanciful. And so it's less threatening than if Thomas More had just said, hey, I don't think the king's governing correctly and here's my five things that he needs to change. Okay? So that's probably one reason why this book also didn't appear to be a threat at all to King Henry VIII. He didn't take offense at this, even though if you think about it, it's definitely a repudiation of the way his kingdom is run. It was a great success because it's very interesting. Not just amongst humanists, but in the general reading population. It was a neat story, among other things. Kind of like reading about the lost city of Atlantis or something like that. How did he get this word? Well, this is uh, neologism. It's a newly coined term, okay? Utopia. And uh, so he coined it himself. So we get the word from him. And it's a play on words, or at least this is what we think, okay? That it combines two different Greek terms, utopos, which means no place, and utopos, which means happy place. Okay? Um, And if you combine the two together, it's a place that doesn't exist that's a happy place, right? So it's an ironic, in a way, an ironic title. But this is what our best guess as to why he used those terms. Now, what you'll discover in the first part of this book is that the first part is it gets the story started when Thomas More himself meets this seaman, uh, Raphael Hithliday. So the very first part of the book, More himself is a character. And through an intermediary, he meets up with this guy who's been uh, on a long trip, sailed, abroad and has come back. And he is the one, Raphael is the one, who then starts to tell the story of this society that he and his shipmates discovered and how they stayed there for a time and learned about their ways so that he could detail all of it. The place is called Utopia. And first of all, it's a pagan state. By that I mean not Christian. Christianity, up until the point the sailors hit the shores, Christianity is unknown in Utopia. So, as we'll find out, they practice a variety of different religions, from animism all the way up to polytheism to even monotheism. It is completely communistic. There is absolutely no private property. And this extends not just to where people live and the jobs that they do, but even to what they wear and the style of the houses they live in and everything. There is no aspect of their lives that is simply their own. The private sphere is pretty much non-existent. Okay? 
about the only place I can think of where there's really a private sphere is all, at all is that people get to decide how much time they want to spend in intellectual contemplation. And he says there's a certain amount that is required and then there are those who are inclined to do more and they are, are allowed to do it and there are people who are inclined to do less and they work more. But as you read it, think about that, that you know, we're so used to having this private bubble around us. You know, privacy is so very important to us. We certainly think that, you remember the story not long ago, that poor man was running around naked in his own home. Somebody walked by the window and he was charged with indecent exposure. Anybody hear that story? Will they ever come out? I don't know. I, I, I never heard anything after that. I think they dropped the charges because he, he was not um, trying to give anybody a show. People walked through his yard, they looked in his window, and then called the police. He was assuming that in his own home, he could do that. Okay? That's generally the, the assumption that we make is that in the privacy of our own home, we can pretty much do whatever we want. Okay? Um, not in Morris Utopia. There is not that the expectation that you can decide for yourself what you want to do, even in your your own home or with your own family. Okay? It's entirely governed by reason as more defines reason. Of course, that's those are the big wiggle words, right? Because it's quite possible that as you read this, you might find yourself saying, well, that doesn't make sense. Okay? What's reasonable about that? So we always have to say as more defines it, you know. What he thinks of is the most rational way to live. That's what you're going to be uh, reading here. Okay? Of course, one of the purposes of this, maybe you might even argue the main purpose of this book, is to contrast those ideal practices that Moore depicts in Utopia with what was actually happening at the time, okay? In England, the England of his own day. In Utopia, uh, there's a whole structure of multiple layers of authority, and these people are not chosen, of course, because of the money that they have or the status they have, because those don't exist. But they are chosen because they are the most suited for those positions. Okay? And there is a democratic element in Utopia. Some of those positions are elected. Okay? Whereas in England, even though there was a parliament, the parliament was kind of a rubber stamp at this time, and people sat in parliament because of the status that they had. Okay? There was no real House of Commons in the sense that common, ordinary people were elected to the House. Okay? <coughs> Those who were wealthy had the power. They had the family backing and connections it took to gain more wealth and to gain more prestige. Those who didn't have those things had no hope. Okay? It's not like in our society we sometimes think that the cards are stacked against us a little bit, right? But you can still envision some people actually just having a good idea and breaking out of poverty and, you, and it, it does happen and we see it all around us. There was no way in this type of society if you were born into poverty <coughs> that you were ever going to escape it. It was a system in which you just weren't allowed. So that was very different. Um, in Moore's perspective, the policies, the laws were designed to keep people poor. People didn't receive any education, and this is something that he changes in Utopia. Every individual receives a basic education. But in the England of his day, there was no education for anybody who couldn't afford to pay for it. Okay? So what we take for granted, they didn't have. Okay? Also, there was regressive taxation. Does anybody know what that means? Uh -huh. Yeah, relative to their income, the poorest were taxed. The poorest poor were taxed more than the rich. And some rich weren't taxed at all. Members of the clergy and the church weren't taxed at all. Many of the wealthiest people in England weren't taxed at all. Okay? So more of the money was taken from what you might call the middle class and the poor relative to their income than the rich. That changes. In fact, there is no taxation because there's no property. So he gets rid of the whole problem in Utopia. Okay? So probably one of the main purposes is just to show this stark contrast between what he saw as the irrational practices of his own country with the rational practices of the utopian. It's a way of criticizing and suggesting change should take place. Okay?
So when we come back on Wednesday, we'll finish up with his background, we'll watch that video probably, and then launch into some of his ideas.